Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Amanda Lacars from Linus. How are you today, Amanda? I'm really well, thanks, Tracy. How are you? I'm fantastic. And I just want to start by congratulating you because you recently announced that you've exceeded production targets and earnings. Uh, and our editor, Robin Bromby, was crediting this for the spark, spark in the rare earth prices that was happening recently, similar to uh, 2011. Can you tell us more about these results, please? Okay, so actually I don't think I would completely agree with Robin. Uh, the result is not price driven, it's actually volume driven. So um, we're very pleased with the quarter's results which we announced on Monday. So total, total tonnes produced are up 30%, NDPR tonnes produced are up 36%, sales revenues up um, 37 percent off the back of a volume increase of 30 percent. So uh, unfortunately the prices are nowhere near where they were in 2011. If they were I would be a much uh, more relaxed woman than I am. However, um, the results are really the result of uh, you know the, the, the culmination of two years where we have finalized the commissioning of all of our capacity um, and brought it into stay, you know, steady operation. And so in quarter three, we uh, commissioned the final separation train for our SX5 unit, which is the unit that separates NDPR from LA and CE products. And of course, that's the key value driver in the business because the magnetic materials are the highest value um, materials in the market at present. So um, in quarter three, there were some costs and some reduced volume associated with that. In quarter four, now we've actually got that operating. Okay, so for our, the Investor Intel audience there listening right now, we're just talking about the fourth quarter results uh, and basically you lifted sales to 196.1 million and you're basically, and this is what you're attributing your success to? Um, so, uh, look, I think, as I said, it, it really is about making sure that we're utilising the equipment that shareholder funds and, 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 and lenders funds have, have been invested in effectively. And so now we have 100% of that equipment uh, commissioned. Two years ago, when I first joined, we only had 50% of the equipment commissioned. So we now have 100%. We produce a lot more NDPR. And therefore, we sell a lot more NDPR because it's certainly the one product where we never have any problems selling it. Okay, so let me ask you, Amanda, are you selling at index or fixed prices as the reported selling prices are much lower than our information on the current market prices? Can you just tell us a little bit more about that? So I think it's always quite difficult when people are trying to track and, and, and analyze prices in the rare earth market. And as you would know, um, the rarest market is not a particularly orderly market. Um, you know, in most markets, demand and price are, are, are fairly closely correlated and you will actually see the effects of one or the other reasonably quickly. Uh, the rarest market remains one which is quite... Um, is still quite distorted by speculation at all levels of the market. And so in this quarter, there was a lot of speculation early in the quarter that the China central government would undertake a new stockpiling program. And typically what that does is it puts a floor price uh, um, uh, for, for materials. And so the price actually did increase if we use uh, um, uh, the local currency from about 252 up to uh, 272 remember. Um, early in the quarter. However, according to the information that we got out of China, the price then dropped back fairly quickly to about 258 remember, and it's come off a little bit more since then, after the government and the big six rare earths companies were unable to reach agreement on the price. Well, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to take this opportunity to ask you about the overall rare earth market, uh, Amanda. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. The, the structure of the market is difficult. Um, the whole of the rare earths industry still wears some of the pain from the 2011 bubble. 
Um, you know, some of that is because uh, companies, you know, uh, put too much debt uh, in their businesses because they looked at the bubble. They thought this was the way that it was going to keep going. So that has actually been a, a real issue in terms of it, it drives speculative behaviour in in the investor base. You know, a lot of lot of in, uh, speculative behaviour there, and also in the the traders and and the and the producers, particularly inside China. But the more sustained damage, I think, to the market really is the fact that at at that time it created a lack of confidence with end formulators. And even just last week, there was an announcement from Honda and Dido about the uh, production of a first rare earth magnet for um, a hybrid vehicle, which was, um, or an electric vehicle it might have been, which was actually heavy rare earths free. Now, for us, this is fine because we're a light rare earths company and it actually reinforces demand for the neodymium and praseodymium products. But, and, and so we actually see that as a very positive thing because what it does is that it starts to give some of the OEMs, the, 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 the end use formulators, more confidence in the supply chain. And I think our continued success is an important part of that. I couldn't agree with you more, Amanda, and uh, I've got a question for, for you from our writer, Jack Lifton. He asks, what is your strategy going forward in the Japanese market if Toyota to Sucho's product, projects come into production? Will you compete on price or quality or both? Uh, so you would know that in the Japanese market we are um, very strong. And uh, certainly, you know, Japanese industry was, I, I, they probably wouldn't use this term, but quite spooked by the, uh, by, by the rare earth bubble. Uh, the automotive industry is still an incredibly important uh, business in, in, in Japan. And it is one of the reasons why uh, Japan by Jogmeg, uh, you know, is our senior secured lender. And uh, that is really about ensuring that there is an alternative uh, outside China supply chain. Uh, we have uh, our commercial partners, our distributors in Japan, our Sojits. Uh, we work very closely with them. We also work very closely with the uh, end users and the magnet makers in Japan. We have well in excess of 50% market share in that market. And we do that by actually working directly alongside our customers. Uh, we, we still sell for a, a slight premium in Japan compared to China, notwithstanding the WTO ruling last year. And uh, we see it as a very positive thing that Japanese industry has chosen to compete on technology rather than on price. And we actually are working very closely alongside to match our activities. Well, of course, Amanda, you've just passed your two-year anniversary at Linus, and I enjoyed a presentation you did where you attributed a lot of your success to operations and running a company. It was actually very inspiring for me. Can you tell me what kind of operation mandates are happening now that you've been there for two years? I imagine everything is under control. Ha! Yeah, everything's under control, always. No, that is not the truth. Even in very, very mature industries with very mature technologies, um, manufacturing operations do not always run perfectly, right? If they did, we wouldn't need people and we wouldn't make, need people to make decisions and do all of those sorts of things. Um, and so my production team has challenges every day, I am telling you that. However, uh, two years on, we have now got 100% of our equipment has actually been commissioned. So two years ago, it was only 50%. We actually have made nearly three times as much. We make nearly three times as much with our four trains as we did with two. So that's a combination of increased capacity, but also increased utilization and efficiency of operation. 
So what should we as shareholders anticipate, say, in the next upcoming uh, quarter or two? Okay, so so I guess, you know, the most important thing for us now is to stabilise and really lock down the improvements that we've made to date. Uh, we indicated in our quarterly report that we would seek to run at about 90% of capacity for about six months as we continue to do some minor de-bottlenecking and then we'll ramp up to the 100%. Um, so I, I think that that's... That that's in terms of operations. I think on the other side, as you will have noted, we have very positive and, and productive relationships with both of our lenders. And I think ensuring that our um, uh, structures with our lenders are such that they continue to support the success of the business is really important. And then uh, for me, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, we've got this beast which had, you know, this this huge factory, you know, built and it operates within the rare earths market. Um, once you've got all of that operating, then the question is where to from here? How do we now grow this business to be an even better business? And I'm not going to tell you what's in my mind on that today. However, watch this space. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Amanda. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Tracy.